In the name of God, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Have y'all seen that meme? Um, it has a little girl, and she's wearing like a little plaid dress and the frilly white sleeves, and she's sitting on a big, overstuffed leather couch, and she's got a big old copy of a book that says New Testament. It's leather bound. So she's reading the New Testament, and the meme unfolds in three panels. And the first panel, she's reading, and she's like, Jesus is so nice. And then she turns the page, and in the next panel it reads, I hope nothing bad happens to him. And the little girl has turned the page again, and in the third panel, her little disappointed face is saying, oh boy. When we hear James and John asking to sit at Jesus' right and left hand in our gospel reading today, we hear it with like a pronounced sense of dramatic irony. Like, we know what's going to happen. We're not like the little girl. We're not like James and John. We know what happens in a few short chapters, and on its surface, oh boy, it is not going to look like what James and John expect glory to look like. I'm sure that Jesus getting crucified is actually not the success story that any of the disciples were hoping for when they joined up. The bad news for James and John is that we're going to read this story two millennia later and think that they're kind of boneheads for asking Jesus for the best seats in the kingdom. Because no joke, like right before, just right before, the verses right before our gospel reading today, Jesus for the third time is telling them, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and be mocked and spat upon and flogged and crucified. This is the third time he's told them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be tortured and killed. And James and John, apparently being completely unable to read the room, come to him and say, um, hey Jesus, so we're going to ask you for something, but you have to say yes, okay? Like they're some devious children trying to trick him into something. And I can just imagine Jesus' reaction, sighing deeply, closing his eyes, maybe pushing up his glasses a little, and running his fingers through his beard. What do you want me to do for you? And James and John ask, grant us the highest places of power in your coming kingdom. James and John want to be the most successful of the disciples. They want to see the view from the top. And it's actually good news for James and John that they are not going to get what they ask for here. God's vision for Jesus' work in the world is not nearly so myopic, not so short-sighted as that of James and John in today's reading. In the system that James and John envisioned, the kingdom inaugurated by Jesus would have a power structure shaped like a pyramid. Jesus at the top, James and John somewhere underneath him. Who really cares where everyone else is as long as you're James and John? The good news for James and John is that God's kingdom is infinitely more generous than some sort of hierarchy wherein they have to trick their way to the top position to be close to Jesus. God's kingdom isn't like the world around them. They don't have to climb and compete and curry favor to be successful disciples. God is far too generous for that kind of plan. Instead, Jesus reminds the disciples that in God's kingdom, that pyramid of prosperity, it's like turned upside down. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. In this 10th chapter of Mark's gospel that we've been reading for multiple Sundays now, Sunday by Sunday, we've heard a different vision that Jesus is offering to his disciples. To love is to keep the law. To be rich is to give it all away. To be successful is to serve. Jesus is inviting his disciples into creating a world turned right side up. And having seen what's on the next page, as it were, we can laugh at the wild misunderstanding that James and John have about the kingdom of God in Mark's gospel. But we still have to grapple with this whole, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first thing. As individual people and as a parish, I think we'd all pretty much prefer the same thing that James and John are asking for, if we're honest. Not to descend to greatness, as it were, 
but to be on top of the pile. It'd be attractive to have power, to have all the best stuff, to make the rules. Power, wealth, status, they're seductive because that's what we think will give us a sense of security. But I think that Mark's gospel begs of us this question. What does it look like for Christians to be successful? What does it look like for us to really flourish in this world? Have you ever heard the phrase, it's lonely at the top? What if it's lonely there because that's not the top? If I gain billions of dollars and I become fabulously well-connected and I have models on my arms at parties and lo, I end up amassing enough cash to be able to rocket myself into space for fun and for glory, who is beside me there? Who am I in community with anymore? God is far too generous for human flourishing to be limited to a few people at the top of a pyramid. That's why in God's kingdom, that pyramid is flipped upside down. Instead of a bunch of people climbing past, climbing over each other, it's a bunch of people reaching out and lifting each other up. That's where we're going to find true security. Human beings are designed by God. We're hardwired for connection. We're wired for belonging. We're wired to experience our utmost happiness, not when we live these lives of power and prestige and peak consumption, but when we live lives of purpose. And thank God that a life of purpose isn't tied to sitting in the top seats. It's tied to loving God and loving our neighbors. We find our deepest purpose, our deepest flourishing in sacrificial love and radical hospitality. And that's available to everybody. Equal access. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Business author Tim Sanders was raised by his grandmother, Billy. And Billy wasn't exactly in the position to take on a child. She was living alone in a farm near Clovis. And Billy's husband, Larry, had done like a little too much gambling in town and had basically taken all of Billy's money and most of her reputation with him when he left. He was long gone by the time that Tim came to live with Billy on the farm. But Tim recalls that every morning Billy would make a cup of coffee and she'd sit down with her Bible and the newspaper. And she'd read the Bible and she'd read the stories in the newspaper. And she'd pray for the people that she read about in those stories. And one morning while Billy was praying, she looked up and saw a man walking through the wheat field toward the house. And Billy got up and she met the man in the field. And Billy asked the stranger, can I help you, sir? I pray so, ma'am, I pray so, he said. My name is Clarence, and I'm looking for a hot meal and a day's work. I've been walking for days from Dripping Springs, Oklahoma. I've just lost every penny I ever had in the swindle, and I'm trying to make it to Arizona where my kin are going to help me get a new start. I just need work, ma'am, just for today. And Billy looked at the man and said, well, we do have some work around here. I could do some help pruning the tops of the peach trees because I can't reach them and the barn could use a good cleaning. And if you'll work from now till sundown and you'll do those things, if you put in a good day's work, I'll pay you $10. Now this conversation made Tim a little nervous because he knew that they were poor. He knew that his grandma Billy only had about $20 for the rest of the month and here she was offering half of it to a stranger. But Clarence got to work, and Tim followed him around curiously, and Clarence worked at a decent pace, but he wasn't very talkative in the morning. And around noon, Grandma Billy emerged from the house with lunch for everybody. It wasn't much. It was hot dogs and canned beans, but there was plenty, and Clarence absolutely wolfed it down. When Grandma Billy slipped out of earshot, Clarence dipped his head towards young Tim and said, Son, your grandmother is an angel. It's people like her that make the world go round. In these last few days, I've had guns waved at me and dogs sicked on me. I really thought I was going to starve before somebody would give me a chance. But 
your grandmother did and son, I want you to look at how happy she is. See? See how much joy she's carrying around with her? And after lunch, feeling energized, now having some calories in him, Clarence finished absolutely everything that Grandma Billy had asked him to do. He trimmed the trees, he had cleaned out the barn, he took out all the garbage and hauled it off. He even repainted all the trim on the barn as an added bonus. At the end of the day, Grandma Billy took a look around and smiled and said, Clarence, we agreed to $10 for a good day's work, but this, this was a great day's work. You deserve twice a good day's pay. And Tim watched his grandmother, Billy, give the stranger her last $20. After a tearful and grateful goodbye, Clarence walked toward the sunset, and Grandma Billy slipped her arm around Tim and said, Timothy, today is a special day for us. Today we are rich. Today we are rich. What does success in God's kingdom look like? It looks like radical, sacrificial hospitality. And I can't speak to how each of your personal lives impacts God's kingdom. That's something for you to meditate on. But I can speak to the life of this parish. And whatever it is that we might lack as a parish, we've got radical hospitality. Look what God and God's generosity has made here. The hands that are reaching out, not up. The people that you're welcoming, the connections that you're making, the lives that you're touching, the people who are changed. This is not a peak Sunday in the church calendar. It's just an average Sunday, but this is a special day for us. Today we are rich because it's Sunday and we're getting to see a glimpse of God's right-side-up kingdom. Today, we are rich. Amen. Amen.